Uh, good morning and welcome to the third meeting of the Social Security Committee in 2018. Can I remind everyone to turn mobile phones and other devices to silent mode as they do disrupt the broadcasting. No apologies have been received for today's meeting. There is only one item on today's agenda, consideration of the Social Security Bill at Stage 2, and it's been agreed that we will not um, proceed beyond Part 1 today. There are 13 groups of amendments in Part 1, and it may be that we do not get through them all this morning, but um, as we have to be finished around about 11.30 to allow members to get to chamber for questions. Um, can I welcome the Minister to um, committee this morning along with their accompanying officials and we now move to stage two proceedings. Can I call amendment 77 in the name of George Adam grouped with amendments 1, 102, 78, 5, 6 and 113 and invite George Adam to move amendment 77 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, convener. I wanted to move this amendment for one very important reason. Uh, I wanted to be the first one out and speaking first. But no, in all seriousness, I actually uh, believe it's important that we set the foundations correctly for this bill. We all know how important uh, this bill is and how it's one of the biggest bits of legislation that this parliament has actually produced since the, this place came into being itself. And I think it's important that we set right from the beginning what we want to actually do. And I th when you say... Everybody talks about documents all over the world. Everybody remembers that the founding principles are mentioned right at the very start of that document. And the idea that the delivery of the social security as a public service, I think, puts that out to everyone exactly what we're trying to achieve. Because during the stage one debate, it was the minister herself that said the Social Security Scotland Bill comes to the parliament as the legislative foundation for a new public service for Scotland to deliver a rights-based social security system that is founded in the principles of dignity, fairness and respect. And I think she's right, and it's noteworthy and a meaningful principle. So therefore, the, the founding principle of the bill should be that it is going to be a public service. I think that sets out to the 1.4 million people in Scotland who will be using the service how important, how important this parliament and how we, uh, how the Scottish government as well, sees that as the way forward and uh, putting these principles forward. So just to... Uh, summarise, uh, convener, is I think it's very important in any documentation, in anything that you do, to get the founding principles correct. And I believe that putting in this amendment at the very beginning tells everyone exactly what we want from the social security system in Scotland. Thank you, Mr Adam. Can I now invite Alison Johnson to speak to Amendment 1 and the other amendments in the group? Um, certainly. Thank you, convener. Um, the principal section of the bill, as my colleague George Adams just pointed out, is absolutely crucial. Laying out the foundation stones of the system sends out a really clear message that the new Scottish system won't be one that will chop and change at will, creating uncertainty for applicants and recipients. And I think the Minister is absolutely right to take this approach, and it's one that I welcome. If every other aspect of the system is going to flow from the principles, which I believe is the policy intention, then it's absolutely imperative that they're the right principles. Um, so I think a principle that the system should reduce poverty is absolutely key. Social Security performs many functions, but one of them is the reduction of poverty, based on the belief that poverty is unacceptable. That's one of the fundamental tenets of the post-war Social Security system, and it should be a fundamental principle of the Scottish system that's now been built. The principle has already been established in the Child Poverty Scotland Act, and as a result of the work of this committee, the Act has several references to the important role Social Security plays in the reduction of child poverty. That being the case, it would be remiss not to have in this bill a similar recognition that Social Security is vital to the reduction of poverty, and for that recognition to be right up front as part of the core principles of this new system. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I now invite Mark Griffin to speak to Amendment 102 and the other <coughs> amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. I'll be supporting the two earlier um, amendments that have um, just been spoken on. The, the, the purpose of Amendment 102 and the related amendments that I've tabled that we'll come to further on in a debate uh, this morning is to make sure that equality is embedded in the face of the legislation 
um, and therefore in the Scottish social security system in itself. Those amendments have the support of um, Gender, Scottish Women's Aid and the Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights. Um, I feel that when uh, equality is not embedded in policy from the beginning, there's the, the danger that it then becomes an add-on, something that happens after the fact that's not been um, considered sufficiently to shape the system in itself. Um, Take-up of benefits for BME groups in Scotland um, is not routinely published and monitored, and monitored to, to, to determine how significant disparities um, come about and to determine the best way to then go on and add and address them. We know that many equalities groups, in particular women, BME groups and disabled people, have higher rates of poverty and therefore may depend on the social security system more, and that is the reason that I have lodged Amendment um, 102. On uh, Amendment 78, I lodged this amendment to, to start a, a debate around the issue, and it is not an amendment that I would be intending um, pressing. Um, it, has come about on the back of support from Disability Agenda Scotland, and that is to, to get a, a debate started on the, the issues faced by disabled people, the higher costs that um, disabled people face in their, their every life, that almost half of the people in this country who live in poverty have um, at least one disabled person in their household, and how the Scottish social security system goes about um, covering the additional costs of a disability that can push someone into poverty or how it breaks down the barriers to, for a disabled person to get into work to lift themselves out of poverty. Um, this amendment was supported by um, Disability Agenda Scotland, as I said, Camp Hill Scotland, Carers Trust, Alliance, the Scottish Independent Advocacy Alliance and Leonard um, Cheshire. Um, but, as I say, this was about starting a debate around um, the poverty that a lot of disabled people find themselves in and how the Scottish social security system can work to alleviate that. Thanks, Camille. Thank you. Um, can I invite the Minister to speak to Amendment 5 and the other amendments in the group? Thank you very much and good morning to the committee. <clears throat> um, if I could start with some of the other amendments in the group, I'm pleased to support Amendment 77 in the name of George Adam. We have always intended, as Mr Adam said, that the Sco Scottish social security system would be delivered as a public service, and I believe this new principle fits well with the ethos expressed in the other principles. I'm also happy to support Amendment 1 in the name of Alison Johnson, a proposal, I believe, which recognises that the Scottish social security system has a role in reducing poverty, and, as I, and I understand it has the support of a wide range of stakeholders, including the Poverty Alliance. Um, I'm grateful to Mr Griffin for uh, his indication that he does not intend to press Amendment 78, which I could not support. Um, I don't believe that singling out a specific group at this point in the bill reflects the spirit of the other principles, but more fundamentally, Amendment 78, um, uh, as it is written, misunderstands the nature of disability assistance and the scope of our powers as ministers in relation to Social Security. Disability assistance is not designed as an anti-poverty measure, although I accept that for some it has that effect. It's not means-tested, it does not seek to top up or replace income. Its purpose is to help people with costs of living who have a disability or terminal illness. The Scottish Government has no control over the forms of assistance that, in my view, could really make an impact on reducing poverty for disabled people. But I do uh, welcome the opening of a debate, one that I'm sure uh, through this committee and elsewhere we will continue to have. Amendment 102, also in Mr Griffin's name, seeks, in my view, to achieve broadly similar goals to Amendments 5 and 6 in my name, but the wording is problematic. Devolved assistance will be capable of delivering equality of treatment. However, it will not be possible or appropriate to seek to guarantee exactly the same outcomes for every person purely on the grounds that they belong to a specific group. To ignore individual needs in this manner runs contrary to the international human rights framework, which, as a broad rule, puts meeting the needs of individuals at the heart of a rights-based approach. 
More technically, the amendment is silent on precisely which category of outcome it is targeted at and to what group or other benchmark the amendment seeks equality with. This makes it difficult, if not impossible, to discern exactly how the system could live up to such a principle. And the amendment also fails to recognise that the term protected characteristics can only have meaning if it is used in a comparative way. Since all of us have uh, age, sex and religion, which for the purpose includes having no religion, use of the term protected characteristics in this amendment doesn't make sense in my view because everyone in that sense has some protected characteristics. I'm sure Mr Griffin will remember that his colleague Ms Bailey and indeed Ms McNeill lodged a similar amendment to the Child Poverty Bill but were persuaded on the basis of the arguments I've outlined not to press these and I hope that Mr Griffin will uh, reach a similar view in relation to Amendment 102. Because I believe equality and non-discrimination are important ideals to capture in the principles law, I hope that Mr Griffin and other members will support Amendments 5 and 6 in my name. Amendment 113, in the name of Ms McNeill, seeks to introduce a new principle on matters I'm sure we all agree are important and worthwhile. However, my view is that health and mental well-being are already strongly reflected in the principles of respect, dignity and in our human rights approach. These existing principles should facilitate a system that is supportive, accessible and sensitive to the particular needs of individuals. This is already taking shape through the commitments made to local delivery, face-to-face pre-claims advice and the elimination of jargon and correspondence. All of this speaks directly to the realisation of a system in keeping with the culture that is envisaged by the amendment. I therefore ask Ms McNeill not to press Amendment 113. Thank you, Minister. Can I now ask Pauline McNeill to speak to Amendment 113 and the other amendments in the group? Thank you very much, um, Convener. Um, amendment 113 um, seeks to promote health and well-being. Um, I believe the social security system has a role in promoting improved health and well-being and this section deals with the principles um, of the legislation and I think there is um, some evidence to support um, the, in fact evidence provided by Sam H that experiences um, of those who've um, had the support of is the employment support allowance and PIP has been stigmatising for some people and has had a negative effect on their health. Studies by Harriet Watt um, show that work capability assessments for employment support have a, had, had a lasting negative impact on some people with a mental health problem. I believe that a well-designed social security system um, must have a real commitment to eradicating stigma. And I, I do think there's a case to have this specifically in the principles. Um, I, I have to say, I'm a bit disappointed that there won't be any, that the, the government won't support specific mention of the importance of the social security system to uh, promote mental health, well-being. Um, but I, I think there's, that I think there's a case for this to be included in the principles of our social security system. Okay, um, and by any other members who wish to contribute to the grouping? I'll take Ms. Mr. Tompkins. First. Thank you, thank you, convener. Um, good morning. Um, uh, we remain very concerned about the legal effect of Section 1. We think that Section 1 is hugely important as a statement of um, uh, political uh, principle, but we remain uh, concerned, and we have amendments later today um, to, that seek to clarify what the legal effect uh, of the principles um, will be. Um, some of the amendments that have been debated in this group, I think, will exacerbate those problems, particularly Amendment 77 in the name of George Adam. It's completely unclear um, what, um, including uh, the delivery of social security as a public service, uh, will do uh, in, the, in the legislation. What difference will it make in the legislation? The, the, the sentiment is, is clear, but the legal effect is obscure. And so we won't be supporting it for that, for that reason. We will be supporting the amendments in the minister's name. Can I bring in Mr McPherson? Thank you, convener. I think uh, Mr Tompkins raises a point that we will we'll get to in, in, in due course around uh, future amendments around the, the, the status of the principles. 
Uh, so I don't want to uh, speak in detail about that now, but I think it's, it's important to uh, recognise that the principles have been set forth as uh, detailed in the, the government's response to our Stage 1 report to define the ethos and nature of the social security system, the Scottish social security system. And therefore, I will be supporting George Adams' Amendment 77 because the uh, clarity and, and the statement around the fact that social, the Scottish social security system will be a public service is important for that description and explanation of the fact that the, the, the that we are creating an ethos and a nature here. The, I will also uh, strongly support Alison, uh, the, the Amendment 1 in the, the name of Alice Johnson, supported by Mark Griffin. I think this is a, a very helpful amendment based on the recommendation that we made at Stage 1. I uh, definitely think that the Scottish social security system should play a part, although it, of course, cannot do so in itself, but play a part in uh, reducing poverty in Scotland. And, and I'm glad to see that uh, we haven't taken forward the word eradication because from a legal perspective and a definitions uh, perspective, I think that would have been problematic. Moving to uh, Mark Griffin's 102, while the, the, the sentiment that's been brought forward, I, I think, uh, in terms of this amendment uh, to try and uh, make sure that there's a, that equality is part of the, the, the system that we're creating and the, that chimes with a lot of the evidence we took and some of the evidence uh, I took in person at, uh, at one of the outreach sessions that we had at MECOP. The minister's wording, I think, around promoting the goals of equality and non-discrimination is more holistic and therefore more effective. So I would urge uh, Mr Griffin not to press 102 and instead to, su to support uh, 5 and 6. Again, on uh, 78, I think the, the, the problematic nature of, of that amendment in Mr Griffin's name is that the Scottish social security system, as uh, created under the, the Scotland Act 2016, does not have the power to create income uh, replacement benefits. And I think that uh, Amendment 78 does not consider that, that position. And in terms of uh, 113, while of course, uh, I think across, uh, in the name of Pauline McNeill, while I, I think of, of course across the public sector, we should be trying to uh, improve health and mental well-being. That is, uh, for me, uh, a, a function primarily of, of the health service and that the, the promotion of health and well-being is already taken into account in the existing principles around dignity and respect and human rights, as the Minister said. And I think it's very important that while we want to try and, as committee members, on the basis of the evidence that we took, while we want to try and enhance the principles as originally drafted, we also need to be mindful and careful about not creating an exhaustive list that might uh, lose, the, lose the meaning that we want to, to take forward in terms of that point that I started on around setting the nature and the ethos of the Scottish social security system. Mr. Balfour. Good morning, Convener, and thank you. Um, I wonder if I can just um, briefly talk to the amendment in Alison Johnson's name and say that um, we will not be supporting that. Um, the reason for that is that I think it puts very high up what the social security system there is for and what the benefits are for. And I don't think the primary reason for benefit is to contribute to reducing poverty. And in fact, I would adopt almost the words by the Minister when she was speaking to another member ago, because benefits are there to help those with disability or terminal illness to live a normal life as possible. And I think that is the key that we want to say about benefits. And now there may well be um, a, a, an added benefit that it, it will contribute to reducing poverty, but that is not the primary reason that we give by people benefit. And, and that is said because we have universal benefits, so PIP, is not means tested in any way. And I think these type of words, if they appear early on within the Act, will could give the implication that some people will be put off because they think, well, I'm not actually poor, I shouldn't be applying for this award. And, and that's why I think this is not a helpful um, amendment. 
and actually deflects away of what we want to see for benefits, which is allowing disabled people in particular, whether it's physical or mental, to live a normal life as possible and to give them the, the, the money to be able to do that and also to help their families to be able to bring in the support that they need. And I think reducing poverty may well be um, a, a, a secondary thing, but to have it as a, a principle within the bill, I think, could in time take people away from applying for benefits because they say, well, actually, I don't fit into that category. Thank you. Do any members wish to come back in and respond? Minister, do you wish to come back in? Um, only to say uh, thank you, convener, for the opportunity that um, I, I want to be absolutely clear with the committee that in not supporting uh, Ms McNeill's amendment, that should no, not at any point be taken as an indication that this government does not believe that the uh, social security system or indeed any other matter that we are engaged in as a government does not have a responsibility in terms of uh, paying proper attention to the importance of mental health and well-being. Um, I, I think um, that would be an unfair characteristic. Uh, I think my reasons in terms of that amendment are very clear. Um, I would also just, if I may, say that I do think Ms Johnson's amendment uh, is important. It's why, as a government, we support it. Whilst uh, the points made with respect to disability assistance uh, not being, uh, being a universal benefit and not being specifically targeted in terms of uh, what is currently PIP or DLA uh, uh, on anything other than to provide additional financial support for those with a disability or health condition, of course, some of the other uh, uh, benefits that we will take responsibility for uh, do assist those on low incomes in particular. I'm thinking about Best Start Grant, funeral assistance and others. And I think it's also important to be mindful, certainly in the government's view, that we are uh, today and as we go forward through stage two to stage three, laying the foundations of a social security system which in this instance will take responsibility for 11 benefits, but it is of course my hope that it will take responsibility for significantly more parts of social security in the future. Thank you. Um, I can invite Mr Adam to wind up and press or withdraw his amendment. Uh, I'd like to press my amendment, uh, convener, but I'd also, just very quickly, because I know we've got quite a lot on today, I think principles and documents historically have always been the part that people have remembered. You know, it's, uh, it's always been the most important part of a document where you can actually state quite clearly and quite succinctly what you're wanting to achieve with all that. And the fact that we are saying that as a public service, it's there to serve the people of Scotland as and when they need it, I think is extremely important in itself because it tells you exactly what that service is for. And I think, uh, not to get involved in too much of what's already been discussed, but I think we have to ensure that that's the way we're looking forward because, you know, people may think that these are just words that we're putting on the document, but words can be extremely important. They can be something that can change history and change people's lives. And I think in this occasion, we're actually stating right from the onset what is the most important point is that we have set up a service that's there to serve the people of Scotland. And I would like to just move my amendment at that point. Thank you, Mr Adam. The question is that Amendment 77 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Um, there will be a division. Uh, the question is that Amendment 77 is agreed. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Okay. Uh, those against? And are there any abstentions? Thank you. Thank you. Um, the result of the division is um, seven votes for and two against, so the um, amendment is agreed. Thank you. I call the amendment one in the name of Alison Johnson, already debated with amendment 77, and ask Ms Johnson to move or not move the amendment. Move. Thank you. The question is that amendment one be agreed to, are we all agreed? Um, so there will be a division and the question is that Amendment 1 is agreed to. Please raise your hand.
And um, those against the amendment? Thank you. And any abstentions? Thank you. So the result of the dis division is seven votes for and two against. Therefore, the amendment is agreed. I now call Amendment 4 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments 7, 7A, 7B, 114, 115, 140, 14, 126, 128, 129 and 51. And I would invite the Minister to speak to her amendment and the other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Uh, this is a group where I hope we can reach consensus. I'll begin with the Scottish Government's Amendments 4 and 7. These have been prepared in response to the views of this committee and stakeholders that Principle D should be strengthened to say that Ministers have a duty rather than a role in promoting take-up. In practice, these amendments go considerably further than that by removing the principle and creating a separate and legally enforceable duty. Amendments 7A and 7B in the name of Mr Griffin seek to change Amendment 7 to state that ministers simply have a duty to ensure that everyone gets what they are entitled to be given. While I am sure that this is intended to strengthen the duty, I would ask Mr Griffin to consider that in fact it makes it weaker than what I propose. Ministers already have a duty to give people what they are eligible to be given. It is their basic duty to determine entitlement to assistance under Section 8 of the Bill. My Amendment 7 requires more than that. It frames the duty as something that requires continuous improvement, with Ministers always keeping under consideration what more could be done. An additional problem with Amendment 7A is that it removes the discretion of Ministers to take steps they consider appropriate. Taking the amendment through to its logical conclusion, this could mean that ministers should take any steps at all within the law necessary to fulfil that duty. It removes discretion and removes the need for ministers to be continually considering the keep under consideration part of my amendment. What more could and should be done to increase benefit take up? And this would apply, of course, to all governments. It is, I think, our Amendment 7, a very active amendment. It also argues that our, our, our language that Mr Griffin's amendment seeks to remove fits much better, I think, with the upcoming amendments on income maximisation. Amendment 7B is, in my view, ambiguous. It defines other social security assistance by reference to schemes other than those listed in the Scotland Act exceptions but the exceptions don't list social security schemes. So I would ask Mr Griffin to consider not moving these amendments on the basis that what he seeks to achieve is, I believe, already delivered by amendments four and seven in my name. Ms McNeill's amendments 126, 128 and 129 are essentially aimed at making life easier for people who apply for assistance by either providing them with information about what else they may be entitled to and where appropriate, treating an application for one form of assistance as an application for another. And I'm pleased to support all three amendments. I will, however, look to discuss with Ms McNeill ahead of stage three, amending this to treat an application of one type of assistance as an application for any other type, to make clear that nothing should be done without the permission of the individual in question in line with the person-centred approach I've referred to, in which I'm sure she supports. Amendments 140, 14 and 51, in the name of Ms Johnson, seek to achieve something very similar. So it seems that there is a broad agreement. But I'm sure Ms Johnson didn't intend this, but the wording of her amendment doesn't meet the intention she outlines. In effect, it means that someone in the agency or on behalf of Scottish ministers who now have this duty placed on them would need to consider any application it receives against eligibility criteria for every other form of assistance and make this decision for people. We think that Ms Johnson would like to ensure people would have information and for applications to be treated as for another type of assistance as Ms McNeill's amendments achieve. And therefore, I would strongly urge Ms Johnson not to press her amendment 
and impose the Social Security Agency having to judge if an individual applying one type of assistance should be entitled to another. This leaves Amendments 114 and 115 in the name of Mr Griffin, and I'm pleased to support these. As I've outlined, we are serious about achieving improvements in take-up as our approach to this group indicates. And I hope that my position on these amendments provides any further reassurance that Mr Griffin may need to reconsider his position on Amendments 7A and 7B. Drawing all this together, the package of measures we support in this group would, I believe, provide a very robust approach to improving take-up, something that I know we all agree should be a priority in a system founded on the ideal that Social Security is a right. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Can I now invite Mark Griffin to speak to Amendment 7A and the other amendments in the group? Thank you, Camina. Um, I would not be supporting Amendment 4 in the name of the Minister, but would be supporting all other, amend all other amendments um, in the group. We feel that um, Amendment 4 goes beyond the evidence given to committee where we were expecting a one-word change um, removing uh, the word role and inserting the word um, duty and that I think was uh, what the, the committee anticipated and what the committee included in its um, report I think with the backing of Citizens Advice Scotland we would uh, therefore seek to reinstate the, the duty in that revised paragraph. We feel that keep under consideration in uh, Amendment 7 is um, an ineffectual wo uh, word in which waters down any uh, duty. The committee agreed, and I'm quoting here, the amendment of the fourth principle in the bill to introduce a duty on Scottish ministers rather than a role to ensure that individuals are given what they are eligible to be given under the Scottish social security system, to which the Scottish Government said in its stage one report, the Scottish Government agrees with this recommendation. This proposal would more accurately reflect the work that would take forward to remove stigma and to improve the take up of assistance and goes on to say the Scottish Government are committed to bring an amendment to the Bill at Stage 2 to place a, a duty rather than a role on Scottish ministers to ensure people get what they are entitled to from the Scottish social security system. Um, I feel that um, my Amendment 7A and B more accurately and um, in stronger, a uh, stronger form of words, uh, reflect the, the committee's recommendation and the government's um, response. Uh, what I've attempted to do in 7B is recognising the minister's um, comments at stage one that um, she doesn't feel it was it would be appropriate for uh, the government to have a, a duty to um, maximise uptake on benefits which weren't responsibility of this government so that's why it is drafted in the way that it is to say that the government should have a role um, in encouraging individuals to apply for the social security assistance that the government isn't responsible for that is um, to at attempt to improve the uptake of the around two billion pounds worth of benefits that go um, unclaimed every year which are mostly reserved <coughs> Um, we've made the argument before that that money could uh, lift uh, families and communities out of poverty and, and boost local economies. And it's, it's reflecting the debate that we've already had um, that, that, that no duty could be applied to the government. And it, it's been drafted uh, to, to accommodate that. On amendments um, 114 and 115, I um, appreciate the government's support for those. Um, those set out wide-ranging requirements in the, the Scottish Government to make its uh, duty to promote take-up uh, a reality, to record uh, progress and, and set out in detail uh, what, um, what areas that, that more work is required. That it's target-based um, it requires government to come forward with measurable outcomes for um, which statistics should be released um, regularly. And I would ask uh, committee members to, to support the amendments uh, lodged in my name. Thank you. Can I now invite Alison Johnson to speak to Amendment 140 and the other amendments in the group? Um, thank you, Convener. Um, I think throughout our Stage 1 hearings, we heard much about how the new Scottish system could be more streamlined and easier for claimants to navigate. And we're all aware of the, the complexities of the current system. 
And in October, Derek Young from Age Scotland told us that people would find it extremely advantageous if there were an opportunity to look at the different forms of assessment and how the processes could be streamlined. We hear quite a bit from older people who complain about having to answer the same question several times. And in written evidence, NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde said, Glasgow City Council has explored automatic payment of benefits and have successfully implemented this approach for school clothing grants by identifying eligible families. The amendment seeks to create a right for individuals applying for any form of assistance to be considered for all other assistance ministers have reason to believe they might enti be entitled to. And I see this very much as a companion amendment to Pauline McNeill's Amendment 128, which seeks to establish this process in the part on determinations. It's also very much in the spirit of the minister's amendment to create a duty on Scottish ministers to keep under consideration what steps they could take to ensure that individuals are given what they're eligible to under the Scottish social security system. This would be such a step. I know the minister shares the intentions of this amendment as she has proposed something very similar as a way of improving the interface between Scottish, the Scottish system and other systems at UK and local level. And just last week on the 24th of January, the minister put forward the very good idea of sharing an application made for Scottish benefits with another agency, the DWP or a local authority, for another benefit provided by them, so that multiple applications don't need to be made. And what this amendment, and I understand Pauline McNeill's amendment, does is to propose, to propose something very similar, but for within our Scottish system. When someone applies for one benefit, they should have the option to be considered for any other benefits that ministers think they might be entitled to. Um, I understand that the minister or other committee members might have reservations about the wording here, and I'm happy to discuss how it might be improved as we go forward to stage three. Um, but I would suggest that what is being proposed here is uncontroversial. It's about helping people, some of whom find the benefit system really difficult to navigate, to, help, to make sure that they receive everything they're entitled to. And that's a theme that runs all the way through this bill. Thank you. Thank you. And can I now invite Polly McNeill to speak to Amendment 126 and the other amendments in the group? Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I think this is a really important part of the legislation that we're discussing at stage two. And I think there's some common ground, I think, with, in, uh, with all of us and what has been said so far in designing a progressive system um, that ensures that someone who comes forward to ask for assistance um, is given uh, that support to find what other assistance they might be entitled to. And we know that there's <clears throat> a huge issue about unclaimed benefits. Um, Amendment 28 um, specifies that where it appears to Scottish ministers that an individual who is applying for a particular type of assistance may be entitled to another type of assistance detailed in Chapter 2, that it may be treated as an application for other types as an alternative or in addition. Um, let me say um, uh, I welcome the uh, Minister's um, support for these amendments. I'm really delighted about that and uh, uh, give that a commitment to work with the Scottish Government um, at stage three. I know this is a concern which the Minister has raised in previous debates to ensure that an individual is clear all the, all the step of the way what has been done in their name. So I'm happy to work with Ministers um, on, on the stage three, if there's any adjustments uh, needing done. Uh, Amendment 129 is important because it specifies um, that the claimant must be informed where it appears to Scottish ministers that they may qualify um, for, for other benefits. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, can I now invite contributions from other members? Take Ms McGuire. I think in terms of 787B, I'm a bit concerned. I, I know Mark Griffin um, gave an explanation there, but I, I still find it a bit ambiguous and I'm not sure what he's trying to achieve. And certainly on my reading, it seems to dilute the, um, the minister's amendment. And I'd be concerned about that sort of loss of, of continuous improvement for ministers. Um, the other amendment I would like to speak about is... Um, Alison Johnson's there. I fully agree with the, um, the, the thinking behind it, but um, I do believe that it's covered in 114 and 115. And the bit that's problematic for me in it is set, setting targets for the take-up. I would hope that the target for take-up would always be 100%, and that would be how we would be 
be, we'd be measuring against that. But I'd also be interested to hear from the Minister if we have baseline take-up at the moment and if... Yeah. OK. Uh, Mr Tompkins. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Our intention in this group is to support the amendments in the name of the Minister, but not the um, amendments in the names of Mark Griffin, Alison Johnson or Pauline McNeill. Um, the, um, it seems to us that you know, a, n a number of the opposition amendments in this group are overly prescriptive and do not need to appear on the face of primary legislation. For example, amendments 128 and 129 in the name of Pauline McNeill, it seems to me, would be better in the operating manual of the new Scottish Social Security Agency than in primary legislation. Um, and amendments 114 and 115 in the name of Mark Griffin on income maximisation strategy seem to us to be over-prescriptive for primary legislation. We're not opposed to the policy uh, intent um, uh, und underpinning these uh, provisions. Indeed, we would encourage the policy intent uh, uh, underpinning these provisions, but we don't see the need for them to be in uh, primary uh, legislation. Um, I, I just pause to note um, uh, Alison Johnston's amendment 140, which I think the Minister is not supporting, is, is an indication of just how difficult it's going to be to navigate the meaning of Section 1. Section 1 says that Social Security will be a rights, Scottish Social Security will be a rights-based system. And Alison Johnston's amendment um, probes the extent to which that rights-based system will become a reality. Um, and it's a, an amendment which the government, if, if I've understood the minister correctly, is not intending to support. So it does just illustrate the real difficulty that we are going to have in implementing this legislation once it's passed in terms of knowing what is a right within the Scottish Social Security system and what is not. Do any members oh, Mr Adams? Yes, I would just like to echo the words of my colleague Ruth McGuire. 7A and 7B with Mark Griffin, I think I know what you're trying to achieve with it and I think that's part of the problem. I'm not totally convinced that that's what you're, if it is about uh, eligibility and income maximisation, I think 114 and 115 achieve that anyway. So uh, I'm not too sure about what you're trying to achieve with 7A and 7B, and that's what probably gives me the doubt at this stage. If I'm confused about it, then probably there's something. I might just be in confusion all the time right now. Uh, that's for others to say and not for me to comment on. But the, the whole point is if I'm, having, if I'm struggling to understand what it's trying to achieve, then I have problems with it. So I won't be supporting 7A and 7B. Do any members wish to come back in? No. I can invite the Minister to wind up. Thank you very much. Um, let me start with Amendments 4 and 7 in my name, which I believe uh, do go beyond what has been asked by stakeholders, not only transforming the role to promote take-up into a duty, but placing it in a distinct legally enforceable position within the Bill, and in a manner that requires Scottish Ministers to continuously consider what more can be done as part of an ongoing policy improvement. In terms of 7A and 7B, making a principle a duty does not, in my view, make sense. And Mr Tompkins has already touched on this, but the principles are not the place to impose legal duties. Um, I'm happy uh, to support Mr Griffin should he move amendments 114 and 115, which would strengthen the duty Scottish ministers would have to ensure maximum possible take-up of Scottish social security assistance. I'm also, as I've said, happy to support amendments 126, 128 and 129 from Ms McNeill, and I'm grateful uh, to her for her indication that we could work together towards stage three to ensure that individuals retain uh, decision-making uh, in this exercise. Um, I would ask Ms Johnson not to move, uh, uh, press her amendments 1401, uh, 14 and 51. I don't believe that amendment 1 is a companion amendment. The problem uh, is that it requires the agency to make the judgment. Uh, and I'd, uh, I believe firmly that in a rights-based system, the decision and the choice should remain with the individual. Um, Ms Maguire also touched on the question of targets, and it is the case that we would have uh, a limited uh, baseline to start from in terms of benefit take-up. We would, of course, be looking to DWP for the current position in terms of benefit take-up. And as members know from discussions elsewhere on, on this whole matter, uh, the DWP does not routinely collect 
such statistics, and where they do, they do not routinely uh, distinguish between the UK uh, or Scotland and the rest of the UK. So there is a, a, a practical uh, difficulty in uh, meeting the requirements of this amendment, and I'm not keen to approve or support amendments that I don't believe we can then deliver on. There is also, of course, the question of what you would set the target. I'm sure all of us would set a target of 100%, uh, and that in itself um, would then uh, make this a relatively um, an amendment that would not take us much further forward. All of that said, convener, I do think that the package uh, that we have brought forward and the amendments that uh, we are, are minded to support will create the strongest possible duty on Scottish ministers to maximise the uptake of Scottish assistance. Thank you, Minister. Uh, the question is that Amendment 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. no. There will be a division. The question is that Amendment 4 is agreed. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Thank you. Uh, those against? And any abstentions? Thank you. The result of the division is six votes for, three against. The, the, the amendment is therefore agreed. I'll call Amendment 102 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 77, and ask Mark Griffin to move or not move. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 102 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. no. There will be a division. Can I ask those for the um, amendment to raise their hands? Those against? Thank you. Any abstentions? Thank you. Okay, the result of the division is three votes for, six again, then the um, amendment is not agreed. I call amendment. 78 in the name of Mark Griffin, already a bit debated with Amendment 77, and ask Mark Griffin to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. I call Amendment 5 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 77, and ask the Minister to move or not move. Move. Thank you. Well, the question is that Amendment Five be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Thank you. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call amendment six in the name of the minister, already debated with amendment 77, and ask the minister to move or not move. Move. Thank you. So the question is that amendment six be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call Amendment 113 in the name of Pauline McNeill, already debated with Amendment 77, and ask Pauline McNeill to move or not move. Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 113 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Uh, we are not agreed. There will therefore be a division. Can I ask those <coughs> in favour of Amendment 113 to raise their hands? And those against? Any abstentions? Thank you. So the result of the division is three votes for, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The question is that section one be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I now call Amendment 57 in the name of Adam Tompkins, grouped with Amendment 138, and I invite Mr Tompkins to move Amendment 57 and speak to the other amendments in the group. Thank you, um, uh, In our Business Committee's Stage 1 report um, on the bill, um, we recommended at paragraph 143 that the Scottish Government clarify the legal status of the principles contained in the bill 
as I say in section one of the bill, and where appropriate, amend the bill to achieve this clarity. And we made that recommendation unanimously um, because we took evidence, um, principally from academic lawyers, um, that the, there was likely to be grave doubt about the legal status of the principles. And my amendment 57 is designed um, to avoid um, what would otherwise be, I think, wholly unnecessary and very um, uh, expensive and potentially quite protracted litigation um, designed to obtain an answer from the tribunals or the courts um, what the answer to the question, what is the status of these principles? Um, Professor Mullen, my uh, colleague at the University of Glasgow Law School and one of Scotland's leading administrative lawyers, said this in written evidence to us, convener, and this is in our stage one report, but I want to read it into the record for today. He said this, if the legal status of the principles is not clarified, citizens and their advisers may be unsure what their rights and the Scottish Government's obligations under social security legislation are, and there may be wasteful litigation to determine their meaning and effect. And my amendment 57 is designed to ensure that we don't have to endure that unnecessary, and as Tom Mullen puts it, uh, Professor Mullen puts it, wasteful litigation to ensure their meaning and effect. And the wording of, section, of um, amendment 57 is based on or drawn from a wording that we already have on the statute book um, in the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2016, uh, which um, provides for the legal status of codes of practice uh, on police searches, which are to be made by ministers um, in that uh, context. Um, and uh, Amendment 57 says, um, uh, as Section 75 of the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2016 says, that courts or tribunals in relevant proceedings may take the principles into account when determining any question arising uh, in the proceedings to which the principles are relevant, but breach of the principles itself does not give grounds to a fresh um, uh, uh, legal uh, action. So that, I hope, clarifies the legal doubt that exists with regard to Section 1 uh, as it was in the bill as introduced and meets the concerns uh, that Professor Mullen and others put to us uh, in our Stage 1 inquiry and um, satisfies this committee's unanimous recommendation in paragraph 143 of our report that this is an issue that needed to be put right at Stage 2. Thank you. Um, can I invite Mark Griffin to speak to Amendment 138 and the other amendments in the group? Thank you, Kamira. I, I lodged um, Amendment 138 because I felt that without any link to the principles that there was a, a real gap in the provision of the Act to ensure that the principles are enforced and that ministers are, are bound by them. Um, we have been in discussion with the government about this amendment. Um, I understand that how it is drafted could have unintended consequences and that there is a potential for um, payments to claimants to be stopped um, as a result of a, a court decision. So I would not be pressing this um, amendment at, at this point um, because of those unintended consequences and hope to explore further with members and the, the government before stage three um, how we can go about closing that. Um, accountability gap in, in terms of um, how the, there is a, a duty on ministers to, to abide by principles. Thank you. Can I invite um, other members who wish to contribute to come in? Right. Mr. McPherson. Was that fully? Yeah. Thank you, convener. Um, I, I firstly speak to, to 57 in the name of Adam Tompkins, which I, I'm glad he brought this amendment forward because I think it's a really important point that we need to consider and both he and I asked questions on this matter during uh, the stage one evidence. I think that we are creating a, a very important and uh, leading piece of legislation here in terms of the devolution of this uh, of powers to the, to the Scottish Parliament and to the Scottish people. And this is an innovative and forward-looking approach to have these principles per se within a piece of legislation. And I think the importance of that cannot be stressed enough. This is something that is defining the ethos and nature of the system within the legislation of creation. 
in a, a similar manner in, 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 in my mind in, in the creation of this parliament under the Scotland Act 98, where it's stated in section one that there will be a Scottish parliament. To me, this section one of the principles of, of, of the bill that we are debating today set the tone, character, ethos, and nature of the Scottish social security system. They are principles to be taken and uh, easily accessible for individuals all across Scotland who, are, who will be interacting with this system. Therefore, I am welcoming that position that they are defining the value, nature and ethos of the social security system on the face of the bill at the beginning. And I think the place for considering their legal status and considering where they have a, a relationship with the individual in terms of rights, the place for that is in the charter. And that's why I would not be inclined to support Adam Tonkis's Amendment 57. However, I will absolutely support his later amendment in a similar manner on the Charter at 61. I am also uh, glad that uh, Mr Griffin has decided not to press 138 as, uh, as he stated. I think there are potential unintended consequences there uh, for claimants uh, and, and cohesion, and um, I thank him for, for deciding not to press. Thank you. Uh, Ms McNeill? Yeah, I want to speak to Amendment 57 because, um, in my opinion, I, th I think this is, will prove to be, if it were to pass Stage 2 and Stage 3, a really important uh, section of the Bill because often uh, courts are not clear on what sources or references it would be competent to use. And I think it makes it absolutely clear that in any um, tribunal, civil or criminal proceedings, um, that courts may take the social security principles into account when determining any question. Um, but I think it's important to note on the second part of that, that the breach of the principles is not itself does not give rise to, to legal grounds. And I think that's an important caveat to that. Um, I, I'm always in favour of clarity where the courts are concerned. I think there's less scope for the courts to make it up if they don't have a parliamentary reference. So I actually think this will prove to be a useful aspect of the bill when it comes to determining what is meant uh, uh, or how to apply the principles um, in cases which I'm, I'm sure will happen in the future. I will do, yes. Um, th thank you, Paul. I think the, the problem which I, 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 I should have touched on in, in my earlier remarks for me is that if we uh, give the, the, the principles the sort of legal uh, effect that 57 would envisage, then we would then need to go through the principles uh, afresh and think about how we create a large set of complex legal definitions around the principles as drafted. So there's a whole set of unintended consequences that could possibly be... Um, I, I don't really see it that way because of the way it's worded. I think if it had said that they must take it into account, I think that would be different. But my reading of is, and I'm sure um, Mr Thompson will get to sum up on this, um, I, I think courts... I could see it envisage a situation where it might be argued that they weren't competent to be a reference point for a court or child, you know. It just seems to me it does provide some, some clarity. And as I say, I think the fact that the part two of it, that's why I'm prone to supporting it, um, is that breach of the principle itself does not give out any grounds to legal actions. I, I, don't, I don't believe, uh, as it stands, that we then have to go back and provide any further detail on, on the principles, but that's just my view. Okay. Um, anyone else want, wish to come in? Can I invite the Minister? Thank you very much, um, convener. Um, on the, the basis of my intention to support Mr. Tompkins' uh, Amendment 61, which we will come to later on the enforceability of the Charter, uh, I would invite him not to move Amendment 57. As Section 2 of the Bill makes clear, the Charter is the expression of the principles in concrete terms. Therefore, it is right that judges take this into account, which is why I would support his amendment on the Charter that we will come to. However, I don't support uh, this, uh, the amendment that he is moving at this point. The principles define the ethos of social security in Scotland. They are high-level statements because they express ideals intended to hold over time. 
But what upholding these ideals look like changes in practical terms as society changes. And this is where the Charter comes in. Its purpose is to translate the principles into the specific actions ministers must take and the standards they must meet to ensure that the principles and ambitions are realised. The Charter is the bridge between the ethos and the services peoples receive on the ground. Every five years, through a process of consultation with the people of Scotland, the Charter will be looked at again. Where necessary, it will be updated so that it continues to reflect what society thinks the principles should mean in practice. In addition to informing the Charter, the principles also inform Social Security regulations, which as members will see when we get to discussing the amendments on the Independent Scottish Commission on Social Security, uh, will assess and report on whether proposals for regulations are consistent with principles. The Commission's report will then form part of this Parliament's consideration of draft regulations. So the principles will be translated through this process with people who have direct experience of the current system into standards outlined in the Charter and to, into legal rules through regulations. Therefore, by taking account of the Charter and applying the regulations, courts and tribunals will already be part of the system for upholding the principles. It is, in my view, neither necessary nor appropriate for judges to look behind the Charter to the principles. By doing so, they would be substituting their own views about what the principles mean in place of the views expressed through the Charter. I don't believe this is a job the judiciary would thank us for giving them. I am, like Mr McPherson, grateful to Mr Tompkins for uh, raising these issues, as he has done consistently, because I think it is important that they're debated and we are all absolutely clear. But as I said, it's right that courts and tribunals have a role in ensuring that the standards set by the Scottish people are met. And that is why I will support Mr Tompkins' Amendment 61 in relation to the Charter. But it should not be for the judiciary also to look behind the standards. And so I'd invite Mr Tompkins not, not to move Amendment 67. I'm grateful to Mr Griffins for, Mr. Griffin for not pressing his amendment and welcome the opportunity of a discussion with him in advance of, section of Stage 3 to see if we can find an appropriate way to meet his intention. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I can invite Mr Tompkins to wind up and to press or withdraw his amendment. Thank you, Camina. I think this has been a really important debate, and I'm grateful to all the members and the Minister who have spoken in it. Um, I think it's important because, as the Committee said in its um, Stage 1 report, um, uh, we believe that the current confusion on the legal status of the principles contained in the Bill is not helpful and that their status must be clarified. There is no other amendment at Stage 2 that clarifies the legal status of the principles, and so I will press this amendment to a vote uh, today. Uh, I will do so because I think um, that it provides the clarity that we're seeking without being overly prescriptive. It's very important, I think, that as legislators, as lawmakers, we don't tell courts how to decide cases. But it is, and this, and this um, uh, amendment does not do that because it provides that, um, that the courts and tribunals may take the principles into account in proceedings that they deem relevant. So it leaves all of the discretion in the hands of the courts and the tribunals. It does not tell courts and tribunals how to decide uh, individual cases. But at the same time, I think if we are translating, as we are, political principles that we all share, notwithstanding the fact that we come from different political perspectives, if we are translating political principles into law, Mr Adam referred earlier um, in moving his amendment, um, the First Amendment on which we voted this morning, um, to principles in documents. This isn't a document. This is an act of Parliament. This is a statute. This is a law. And it is incumbent upon us as lawmakers to ensure that courts and tribunals and the people who will use courts and tribunals have clarity and not vagueness about the meaning of the words that we are putting onto the statute book in Scotland. This committee was unanimously of the view in its stage one report that section one does not have that clarity and my amendment 57 seeks to bring that clarity. I very much welcome Mr McPherson's and the Minister's support for amendment 61 on the Charter to which we shall come. But legal clarity about the Charter and legal clarity about the principles are both important. They are not substitutes for one another. And section, then my amendment 61 does work which is different from the work which is done by amendment 57. And so for that reason, um, I will press 
Amendment 57. Thank you. Um, the question is that Amendment 57 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Um, <laughs> there will be a division. Can I ask those in favour of Amendment 57 to please raise their hands? Those against? The result of the division are five votes for and four against. The um, amendment is therefore agreed. I call amendment 138 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with amendment 57, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. I call amendment 7 in the name of the minister, already debated with amendment 4, and ask the minister to formally move. Move. I call Amendment 7A in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 4. Mark Griffin to move or not move? Move. The question is that 7A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Um, there will be a division. Can I ask those in favour of Amendment 7A to please raise their hands? Those against? The result of the division are three votes for and six votes against. Therefore, the amendment is not agreed. We call amendment 7B in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with amendment 4, and ask Mark Griffin to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. I ask the minister to press or withdraw amendment 7. Move. The question is that Amendment 7 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Thank you. I now call Amendment 8 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments 9, 58, 59, 112, 139, 39 and 75. And I invite the Minister to move Amendment 8 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. I'm grateful for the opportunity to open uh, the discussion on this group, and I'd like to start by stressing the areas where I think we all agree. We agree on the importance of independent advocacy and advice. We agree that it is vital that people have a right to receive information about how to access the support they need when interacting with the new Social Security Agency. And we agree that there should be a statutory duty on ministers to ensure people know about the independent advocacy and vice services that are available. All that said, I want to take this opportunity to ask Mr Balfour not to press amendments 58, 59 and 75, because, as I know and other members know, there remain disagreements amongst our stakeholders as to the appropriate definition to define the group of people who should receive this support. I, and I'm sure Mr Balfour and colleagues, can well understand the difficulty. This is not easy, but I do want us to try. I would uh, ask Mr Balfour not to proceed on the basis of disagreement, but to work with us to see if we can reach an agreement with stakeholders and representative organisations in advance of stage three. I think an agreement can be reached, but I want us to use our time before section three to get this right and ensure that we are providing support for those who need it. As things stand, Amendment 9 sets out the Scottish Government's starting point, our baseline, if you will, that we are prepared to move on if we can agree, reach an agreement uh, in advance of Stage 3 on how far we need to move. Amendment 9 provides a specific right to advocacy and places the Scottish Government under a direct duty to ensure that sufficient advocacy services are available. We have used the definition of mental disorder set out in the Mental Health Act 2003 as our starting point, but I'd stress it is only a starting point to define the group who will have the statutory right to advocacy. I believe that individuals covered by the definition in the 2003 Act, which includes those with learning difficulties, mental illness or a personality disorder, are those who would most benefit from an advocate to assist them in discussions with the Social Security Agency. 
However, I realise that there may be others who do not fall into this category but require such advocacy. And as I've said, I'm open to further discussion to develop this definition in advance of stage three. Our proposals are further strengthened, I believe, by Amendment 39, which places a right for an individual to have a supporter if they need or want one. A supporter could be a friend, a family member, or someone from any one of the excellent organisations that provide uh, independent advocacy and advice services across Scotland. I have heard, and Ms McNeill raised this during stage one debate, that the right to a supporter is not consistently honoured during uh, health assessments in the current DWP system. That runs contrary to our rights-based approach, and if we truly want our system to have fairness, dignity and respect at its heart, then we should give people the right to have a person to support them when they need it. Mr Balfour has lodged amendments 58, 59 and 75, which also address the issue of advice and advocacy. Amendment 58 would place a right in the bill for independent information and advice to be provided for anyone applying for or thinking about applying for Scottish Social Security assistance. While I agree with this in principle in its intent, it is similar to the aims of Amendment 8 in my name. Mr Balfour's amendment provides a list and advice topics that should be provided. I don't think we should be restricting what information and advice should be provided. I believe that providers of independent advice should, by definition of their independence from the system, be allowed to advise on any aspect of Social Security, as well as operate in a manner in which best serves their clients. Also, much of what Mr Balfour's amendments list, such as what assistance an individual is entitled to, or the content of the Social Security Charter, are, I believe, covered by other aspects of this bill. That is why I'm asking Mr Balfour not to press his Amendment 58, and I'd urge the committee to support Amendment 8 in my name. Amendment 59 widens the entitlement to independent advocacy services to everyone who has applied for Social Security assistance. And as I said earlier, we know that our stakeholders are uh, divided on this matter. And as I've said, I want to get to stage three where we can agree on a definition of the group that uh, requires this support. Um, and as I've said earlier, I would urge Mr Balfour to work with us and with our stakeholders and indeed with this committee uh, to ensure that we can secure that in advance of stage three. Uh, I know, uh, convener, that uh, Amendment 75 is a technical one uh, from Mr Balfour and would not be required uh, to be uh, pressed if he chooses uh, not uh, to move Amendment 58 and 59. If I turn to Amendment 112 in Ms Maguire's name, I'm pleased to support this amendment on inclusive communication as it goes to the heart of our ambitions to take a rights-based approach and to place the needs of individuals at the centre of a new public service, and I know it is one that stakeholders have pressed for. Supporting this amendment would mean that Ms. Amendment 139 in the name of Mr Griven is not required, as essentially they have the same aims. Amendment 139 has difficulties, in my view, in that it is overly prescriptive about the kinds of information it lists, such as claim forms and notices of determination. These are basic and fundamental documents which will be provided to people in an accessible format if we support Ms Maguire's uh, amendment in a particular uh, accessible format to a standard uh, as a matter of course. In addition, it is important to remember that our system has co-production and a rights-based approach as two of its founding ideals. The people who will use the system through our experience panels and by other means are helping us to design the forms and the correspondence and therefore helping us to make sure that the system and these matters are accessible. I have asked Mr Balfour not to press his amendments 58, 59 and 75, but if he would does choose to go ahead, I would urge a committee not to support these along with Amendment 139 for Mr Griffin, but instead ask members to support numbers 8, 9 and 39 in my name and 112 from Ms Maguire. 
I believe that these, along with uh, previous amendments, will provide a much stronger legislative framework for advocacy, advice and support for those who will use the social security system and that we have the opportunity today to uh, move forward in this matter, but also to continue discussions in advance of stage three to reach further agreement around the question of independent advocacy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for the record, Minister, could you move Amendment 8? I move. Thank you. Um, can I invite Jeremy Balfour to speak to Amendment 58 and the other amendments in the group? Uh, thank you, Mary. If I can work backwards, um, we will be supporting Mark Griffin at 139 and also Ruth Maguire at 112. Um, I believe actually they are both very important pieces uh, uh, amendments and they actually do something slightly different. Uh, I think they deal with different disabilities and different inclusion. And so actually I think both of them on the bill um, would be helpful. And although um, the minister again has indicated that um, they're working with stakeholders um, to design forms and everything is going to be cuddly, um, we do have to put legislation that is down there for years to come. Uh, and I think to have the protection for those who have got visual um, and communication impairments is actually um, really helpful. If I could turn to the two amendments, uh, or the three amendments in, in my name, um, from someone uh, who has spent 20 years sitting on tribunals, and also as somebody who himself had to apply for GLA and also for the new PIP, um, I think this is actually a very important area going forward for claimants. Um, I firstly welcome that there is now a clear recognition, both from this committee and from the government, that there is a difference between advocacy and, a di uh, and that of information and advice. Uh, and I think initially, perhaps particularly within the committee's thinking, these were seen as collectively the same thing. Uh, and I think to pull them apart is very important. And um, so I welcome that, and I welcome the way that the government has um, uh, put forward two separate um, amendments. If I can turn to Amendment uh, 58 um, and move that, um, I will be pressing this one um, at this stage. Uh, the reason for doing that is that I think there needs to be clearly set out within this bill, and hopefully act, that claimants uh, will be entitled to information and advice. Um, that will range from somebody going in to the local CAB, advice shop, or, or other charity, or other organisation, and saying, I've got this form, I just simply do not know how to fill it out. Uh, I was talking to a family member who has a, a daughter who has um, Down syndrome, and they are transferring at the moment from um, DLA onto PIP. Um, she is very well educated, but they're literally just trying to fill out that form without any help um, caused her immense stress and difficulty. And I think a lot of the issues that will be resolved is that if people go and seek advice and assistance at an early stage, get the form filled out in a way that is helpful and correct, and then the system should then flow much clearer after that. However, for others, there will be the need for help in regard to uh, going to tribunals if that's necessary and other legal issues. And so I do think it is important that we move, uh, that, 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 fi that section 58 is there, uh, and I would move that. In regard to independent advocacy, um, I, I'm grateful that the minister has put down what she has. Um, I do believe at the moment that the definition in regard to mental disorder, which is in, with, in her section, is too limiting and does exclude people who would need that. Um, I do recognise that my amendment opens it to anybody and everybody, and I also accept that that may be too wide a definition. And so I am, at this stage, going to not move section 59, and we will support the government's amendment, but under the caveat that we do need to get a better definition 
for mental disorder, and if we cannot find that by the stage by stage three, then it would be my intention to reintroduce my amendment because ultimately if we can't get a definition that we agreed on, I think it's better to be too wide than too narrow. Um, I think also it is very helpful the, the um, wording that the Minister again and, and uh, Paul McNeill have got in regard to having somebody there. For me, advocacy for some people will require a professional help, will require someone who's paid to do it. But for a lot of people, advocacy will simply be uh, somebody who can sit with them, a, a family friend or somebody like that. And, and I think um, advocacy has to be seen in a very holistic and wide-ranging way. Um, and I think hopefully with using stakeholders and other people's advice, we can get to a definition which allows people to feel that they will have somebody there for the whole process um, to give them the support that they require. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, can I invite Ruth Maguire to speak to Amendment 112 and the other amendments in the group? Thanks, Convener. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that I'm grateful to Kim from the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists, um, Inclusion Scotland, Citizens Advice Scotland and Camp Hill Scotland in all their work on this amendment. Um, inclusive communication is communication which is inclusive of the largest number of people in the population. I think the key message would be that inclusive communication is for everyone and no one has ever complained that a public service was too easy to understand or to get your point across to. Communication disadvantage is strongly associated with socio-economic disadvantage and we all know that difficulties understanding complex instructions, expressing yourself verbally as well as the ability to read and write is a major barrier to education, employment and outcomes generally. Studies have shown that 80 to 100 per cent of young people not in employment, education or training have underdeveloped communication skills. Communication disability is also experienced by many of those living with disabilities and long-term conditions, including everyone who has an autistic spectrum disorder, dementia or Parkinson's, and around 80% of people with a learning difficulty and at least 30% of people who have had a stroke. If communication is not inclusive, we can expect that actual and potential recipients of um, entitlements, won't respond to advice and information, won't turn up, will make mistakes in applications and won't fulfil their obligations. Uh, yes. I'm grateful to the member. In regard to, would she recognise that her amendment doesn't help people who have visual impairment and you can't communicate if you can't read the form and that's why the form needs to be right before you can communicate. I think that your question gets to the key of it. This isn't about forms. Inclusive communication is about giving information and letting people um, provide the information that we're looking for in whatever form, uh, uh, mode, <laughs> not form, paper form, that, that they need to. Um, so, I mean, I, I think where we don't have inclusive communications, which would include Braille and, and, and these things, um, we'll have a lower take up of entitlement. Um, things will take longer. Um, there's reduced efficiency, which can mean more cost. And um, troublingly, there's an increased potential for frustration and challenging interactions between staff and recipients. Um, I think we need this on the face of the bill. There's an opportunity for Scotland to lead in transformational change. Um, it took legislation to implement inclusive, um, communication inclusion for BSL users, and I think we need it for all communication disadvantaged groups. Um, so this centralised approach supported by primary legislation will facilitate consistency and mainstreaming of quality, inclusive communication practice that is for everyone. And I would urge everyone to support this amendment. Thank you. Um, can I now invite Mark Griffin to speak to Amendment 139 and the other amendments in the group? Thank you, Convener. I'll come on to uh, 112 and 139. I just want to speak um, about the, the committee's recommendation and the government's um, response that independent advocacy should be um, included in the bill. I welcome um, the minister's amendment and how she has set out that um, we'd be looking at, at that as a, as a baseline um, of entitlement and looking to work further 
towards stage three as to how we can get a, an amendment that more adequately fits with what stakeholders are, are looking for and to make sure that um, everyone who needs and would, and would benefit from, from advocacy would be adequately um, supported and so we'll be supporting um, the Minister's um, amendments in this group. Um, on uh, 112 and, and 139, um, my own amendment 139 is um, supported by I, um, RN, RNIB and I thank them um, for the work that they've done with me on that. Um, um, I and stakeholders don't feel that 100, um, Amendment 112 fully uh, covers um, accessible formats. It, it recognises the importance of communicating in an inclusive way, which we welcome, um, but that doesn't ensure that all documents relating to the system will be uh, accessible. I think ministers can um, quite easily have um, regard to the importance of communicating in an inclusive way, but not follow through on that um, with any real adjustments that would make the, the system inclusive. Um, my amendment 139 sets out exactly which information would need to be accessible. Um, and as a result, I think I and stakeholders feel that um, um, that is much more um, comprehensive. Um, I, I would argue as well that the amendment goes... Yep. Thank you for taking intervention. Your amendment is quite prescriptive about what's needed, and if that's on the face of the bill, if, if there are additional forms to be added or, or types of um, paper and, and things that are needed, does that mean we'll need to amend primary legislation to update um, it? I'm happy to come back and amend again at stage three to reflect that um, further information could be required and that, that those could be added. Um, at, at a later stage, but I would be continuing to, to press with the amendment as it is um, at this point. Um, yep. I mean, is, is the point that uh, Ruth Maguire makes not covered by paragraph H of your amendment, which says any other document which yep. the Scottish Ministers are required to publish? Yep. yep. Thanks, thank Mr. Tompkins for that helpful intervention. <laughs> um, and I would, I would close there. Mr. Griffin, um, do any other members wish to come in on this? A Alison Johnson. Oh. I believe it's the case that I'll be supporting all the amendments we've discussed so far. I, um, you know, I don't see the, the Ruth McGuire's amendment and Mark Griffin's on the subject of inclusive communication and accessible information are mutually exclusive, and I thank them both for the the work they've done in those areas. Um, I very much hope that we do arrive at a strengthened position regarding right to advocacy at stage three. Um, I appreciate the Minister's commitment to, to look at that um, issue more broadly and I agree wholeheartedly with Mark Griffin when he says, you know, currently the, the position is a baseline one. Um, if Mr Balfour, though, is content to, to withdraw his amendment for the time being with that guarantee that a strengthened um, amendment will be brought forward at stage three, then I too am content with that. And I think it's right to say too, the committee has given you know, good time to discussing the need for advocacy and the need to advice. And there is really a recognition that some people require one, some people will require the other, and some people will require both. And it's really important that the completed bill gets this absolutely right. But I'll be supporting all the amendments. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms McNeill. Um, thank you. Um, as other members have said, I think it's a really important aspect of the bill, and I'd like to wholeheartedly welcome um, the Scottish Government's approach to this in principle, um, that we are recognising the importance of advocacy in the system, and that there's a, obviously a differentiated position between those who professionally advocate on behalf of others and those who are there to, to support. Um, just to clarify, um, when I was talking about this at, the, at stage one, it was many professional advocates were saying that they weren't they weren't allowed to speak on behalf of claimants because there was no formal recognition of the role. So I think it should be welcomed by all of us that the principle is going to be contained within the bill, and perhaps between now and stage three, um, we can get some consensus about how wide that is. Um, I always find stage two a bit of an odd procedure because if you're the mover of the 
group, then you sum up. But if you've got an amendment in the middle, there's no summing up procedure. So I think um, interventions are, um, are, are important. I would like Jeremy Balfour to perhaps intervene in me to answer this question. Um, right. Um, now, Amendment 58... Um, about information and advice, and, and as you rightly point out, there's an important difference between advocacy, support, and information and advice. Um, now, I'm interested in this amendment. I just wanted to, take, to be absolutely clear what, you, what the implications of 50A are. Um, so, an individual applying or considering applying for assistance to the Scottish Social is entitled to independent information and advice about, in particular, how to apply for assistance, etc., etc. Um, does that mean that there is a financial implication for the government in making that provision? How did you envisage that 58 would be supported if it's passed into the, the Act? If, if I could, could intervene, yeah. if that would be... I'm, I'm grateful. Um, I don't see this changing how things work at the moment, right. uh, particularly in that Scottish Government, through local authorities or through other ways, already fund CEB the advice shops in some parts of the city. Um, now, that either comes through local government or it comes through national government. Um, and also, for example, here in Edinburgh, we've got the things like the Grant and Information Centre within uh, Mr McPherson's uh, constituency. And I think that's the type of people that we would be seeking to continu continue to do the work. Um, so I don't see this as a major change in what is already happening. There would be a financial... Um, money that would have to be provided for that, um, but I think that has already been provided by um, either Scottish Government or local authority. And I think to answer the Minister, um, it is not absolutely prescriptive. My A2E are things that could be looked at, but I've clearly worded it that it is not prescriptive. That is not the only things. So um, I think for me, there would not be a major change in regard to what's happening already, but it's just speech on a statute basis, which is not there. Thank you, that's very helpful. Thank you, uh, uh, thank you. and um, uh, helpful interventions were um, welcome, but just to be clear that I will try and let members in before we move to summing up, if they want to come back on issues. Um, uh, I now uh, invite Mr Adam and then uh, Mr McPherson. Thank you, Convener. Uh, we've, we've talked about this. I, I agree the importance of getting this right. And I, I know we've, we've talked about this constantly. Like we've been around the houses in this one uh, with regards to advocacy and uh, uh, advice. But one of the things that I've got some concerns with, and, and Mr Balfour kind of touched on it there towards the end of his contribution, was the fact that that's already being, there's already is these process and these advice centres. But currently it's quite patchy. All, all over the country, you've got, you know, you have a situation in my own area where you have both CAB and you have uh, council advice, plus you have other organisations. Other areas you don't have that necessarily. Mm. And uh, the whole point is in getting this right, I think we need to make sure that we know exactly what we're trying to deliver. And that's why I have problems with 58 in particular. Uh, Jeremy uh, Balfour also says that, you know, he wants people to have someone with them. Their advocate might be a friend or fam a family member. Now, that's exactly what the Minister's already offering, and the right to have a supporter. Uh, and the right... Well, OK, no problem. I, I, I'm grateful to you, Mr. I mean, I think that is the issue, again, that we're getting confused on. Uh, somebody, depending on what their disability is, may require at a tribunal or at a medical assessment or whatever, they may require a, a friend or an advocate there to give them the support that they need. But they also then need somebody to be able to put their case across in a way that is legally understandable. And again, I think there is an absolute difference in function between the two. And so often at tribunals, you end up in a, in a good situation where it's right for the claimant, that the claimant has maybe um, a parent or a friend or a brother sitting there giving them emotional support, but then we have somebody else there from CAB who is able to put across their case and explain why they're entitled to that benefit. So I don't think it's an either or. It can be, or it can be both, and that's what this seeks to do. 
that kind of makes me even more concerned is the fact that we're back to the muddling, as I've already mentioned, the fact that we don't necessarily, some areas don't have CEB support in their area or other advice areas, and I'm, I'm a bit concerned that we're going back to this muddling of advice information, uh, advocacy and uh, uh, moral support. I think we need to make sure that we're clear in this one, and we have to ensure that we uh, create a system that everybody gets the access to the advice that they need, but at the same time, I do not think 58, whether, well, however well-intentioned it is, does actually do that for us. And one of, my, uh, one of my questions would be to both the Minister and to Mr Balfour when they're summing up is, uh, you know, who would provide this? How would you provide this? How and who would provide this uh, service and how do they see it? Because at this stage, it seems like warm words, but there doesn't seem to be anything there. to all those who, who've brought amendments on these points. I, I absolutely recognise the importance of independent advice and independent advocacy, and I think the evidence that we took throughout stage one uh, was crucial in delineating between the two different aspects. Uh, and sometimes it, it was muddled in evidence sessions that we took, particularly at the beginning. That's why I think we need to be very clear about that and, and, and distinctive in, in that differentiation between advocacy and advice, as, as Jeremy Balfour stated. The recognition of the importance of both is uh, taken forward by, or would be taken forward by the, the Minister's Amendment at eight, and that's exactly why I'll be supporting it. And the right to advocacy, the right to advocacy, will be taken forward in the Minister's Amendment nine, and that as well, I'll be supporting that. I have uh, difficulties around 58, and it's it's uh, for these reasons. Like I said, I think the importance of uh, independent advice and independent advocacy uh, is is both uh, significant. However, uh, I think to 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 place an entitlement to independent information and advice when we need to be pragmatic and we need to consider, as Mr Balfour alluded to in his, his comments, that the local government funding settlement currently covers this in, in, in this city and, and elsewhere. So I think giving an entitlement to a right to advocacy is important, but a right to advice is something different and it's not a right to independent advice. Um, if a right to information and advice in itself would have been something to, more pragmatic to consider, but independent information and advice is something much more problematic for delivery and something that, as I said, is already covered by the local government funding settlement. I appreciate the, the position that Mr Balfour has taken on 59, and, and I'm grateful that he for the reasons and, and the fact that he, he, he is not going to press that. I fully support my colleague Ruth Maguire in terms of absolutely the recognition of the importance of inclusive communication. Um, the, I, I think this covers the uh, holistically and uh, comprehensively the points that Mark Griffin seeks to add in 139. And I do have... Uh, while I appreciate the, 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 the point that Adam Tompkins made about how H gives accessibility to, to new documents, I don't think we need to be uh, as exhaustive as the list in Mark Griffin's uh, 1392 uh, takes, uh, seeks to take forward. So I would, uh, won't be supporting 139, but will be supporting 112 because that is uh, absolutely quite rightly recognising the importance of inclusive communications. Okay, uh, I'm conscious of time, but Ms McGuire, if you... Yeah, just quick, very, very briefly, Convener, just, just to add to what um, Ben McPherson was saying there about advice. One of my main concerns about 58 is that people who, who need advice and who, who get advice from citizens' advice or from local authority money matters teams or, or housing, it's about all aspects of their life. It can't be sort of dealt with in isolation. And I think that's where it gets very complicated, making it an entitlement. And because it is provided by um, multiple providers, just wanted to have that on the record. OK. Um, does anyone wish to come back in? Very briefly, Mr uh, Balfour, but yes. I, I just want to pick up two points um, which have been raised. I mean, I think the first thing is, um, 
how will this be implemented? Well, it, section 58, subsection 4, it's delegation by ministers. So I think that is how it will work. Uh, and I'm just slightly intrigued by George Adams' comment, because I do agree, somewhere like Paisley, there is good advice. Scottish Borders is good advice. Here in Edinburgh is good advice. And I agree it is patchy in other parts of the country. But just because it's patchy in other parts of the country doesn't mean that those in other parts of the country should not be entitled to the same type of advice and assistance that we get whether we're in a big city or in, in a rural place. And I think that that's my slight concern, is that you're kind of arguing, well, we, we can't... Sure. Basically, what I'm trying to say is uh, the argument is that we're making a right for them to get that advice, but I'm saying that... The, that it's the cart before the wheel kind of situation here. You know, you've you've really, if you admit that there isn't actual advice there, then you're saying they've got the right to do that. Then where's the or where's the structure? That's what I asked you. I said, how would you deliver it? Well, I think we would deliver it through uh, supporting to be more CABs across the whole of the country. Would be one very practical way of doing it. Did you take an I'm convinced the community wants me to wind very, up. Just very briefly, I, I think it's really important to note that Citizens Advice Bureau and Citizens Advice Scotland do magnificent work. But locally, for me, there are a number of yep. housing associations, yep. the yep. local authority, yep. individual yep. community associations, yep. and I think there needs to be space yep. and room for all of those. Absolutely. So, so and, there's and not a absolutely. simple answer to this. Ab and absolutely. I think Ab it's absolutely. Very unclear. And it will be up to the individual claimant to decide which organisation they want to go to as happens at the moment. You, in Edinburgh, you can go to CB, you can go to the advice shop, you can go to the Grant Information Centre, you can go to this. I'm not being prescriptive. I allow it to the claimant to make the decision who they want to give that advice from. Okay. Mm. Um, I think we're going to move to the Minister to sum up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, convener. I will try to be as brief as I can. Um, can I start by uh, saying I'm grateful to Mr Balfour. Uh, uh, for not moving Amendment 59 and, and for support for the Government Amendment and to him and other committee members for um, their understanding about the approach that I want to take. Uh, I think Amendment 9 uh, does do what uh, many stakeholders have asked for, but as I've made clear, I fully appreciate that it is our baseline and uh, I look forward to the constructive discussions that we will have as we move towards stage three with stakeholders and uh, Mr Balfour and others to try and improve on that position if it's at all possible. Um, I <clears throat> would urge uh, likewise support for Amendment 8, uh, stating that Scottish ministers must have regard to the role that independent advocacy and advice can have in ensuring that an individual is given what they are eligible to be given under the social security system. This must include providing or ensuring the provision of information about independent advocacy and advice to those individuals. Uh, that takes me to the difficulty I have with Mr Balfour's Amendment 58, uh, which I, I would urge him not to press, but if he does, uh, I would uh, urge the committee not to support. Um, I, for a number of reasons. I think it is overly prescriptive in the terms of the nature of advice uh, which, uh, for me, is not uh, an appropriate prescription uh, to give to independent providers of advice. I also think, uh, whilst I am sure it is not intended, I think the wording of the amendment is ambiguous in terms of the implications uh, for resource allocation and resource demand. And I think that ambiguity, uh, where we lack clarity in that, where we're talking about uh, the potential expenditure of public resource is not ambiguity at this point that makes for good law. And so I'd urge members to not support Amendment 58. Uh, I'm uh, grateful for support for uh, Amendment 39, which places a right for an individual to have a supporter if they need or want it. I think, uh, if I may say so, I think this is a significant part of this legislation. Um, there has not, it has not been much pressed for, uh, but I know that stakeholders uh, welcome it greatly, and I think it will, for everyone who uses Social Security in Scotland, make a significant difference. We all need somebody sometimes beside us to give us a helping hand. I've got three of them right at the minute, um, but I, I fully appreciate the importance of that, simply in psychological terms, if for no other reasons. I'm very happy to support Amendment 112 in Ruth Maguire's name. Um, inclusive communications is precisely that. 
Uh, it supports a rights-based based, uh, approach, which is at the very centre uh, of the Scottish system. Um, and for that reason, I would ask Mr Griffin not to move 139, um, for two reasons. Uh, first of all, the, the inclusive communication uh, has a standard to which the Scottish Government is signed up. It was part of the uh, argument that stakeholders uh, brought to us, uh, and that Ms Maguire has now uh, translated into her amendment, and it uh, does include, uh, of course, those individuals with visual uh, or hearing uh, impairments. Um, it's also the case, of course, that the Equality Act places an additional duty on us all uh, to ensure that communication uh, is accessible. And communication, of course, is much wider than um, forms and um, bits of paper. Uh, and I know whilst we all appreciate that, it is also important to say again that we are establishing a social security system, um, not just for 11 benefits, but capable, should that opportunity arise, for growth and to be founded over the years. And consequently, um, it is reasonable to expect that the kinds of written and other communication that the agency uh, might wish to uh, use uh, is reasonably uh, likely to change over time. I'd also remind members again that um, we uh, have committed to co-production in terms of how the agency communicates with those seeking the assistance that they're entitled to. And I would not want unintentionally to exclude our experienced panels and others to whom we've made that very strong commitment by anything that we might do for the best of reasons, but unintentionally we cut them out uh, of what might be possible. Um, with that said, um, I would uh, urge uh, members uh, to support the amendments in my name uh, and in Ms Maguire's name and uh, also uh, again express my gratitude to Mr Balfour for not pressing Amendment 59. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Um, I'm very mindful of time and that that was an important debate to, to let run on. I feel for the CHU proceedings, but I'm minded to have a five minute comfort break for members. Um, please be back in your seats by um, uh, six minutes to 11 to get started to continue. Thank you. Eight minutes to thank
Um, the question is that Amendment 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Uh, there, we are not agreed, so there will be a division. Can I ask that those in favour of Amendment 8 please raise their hands? Those against Amendment 8? Okay. Any abstentions? No, thank you. The result of the division are seven votes for and two votes again, so Amendment 8 is agreed. I call Amendment 9 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 8, and ask the Minister to move formally. Moved. Okay, now the question is that Amendment 9 be agreed. agreed. Thank you. Um, call Amendment 58 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with Amendment 8, and ask Mr Balfour to move or not move. Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 58 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. No? Was that a no? Um, they, so they um, are not agreed, so there will be a division. And the question, I can ask those in favour of Amendment 58 to please raise their hands. Those against? The result of the division are um, five votes for the amendment and four votes again. Therefore, the amendment is agreed. Call Amendment 59 in the name of Jeremy Balfour. Already debated with Amendment 8 and ask Mr Balfour to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. Now call Amendment 112 in the name of Ruth Maguire. Already debated with Amendment 8 and ask Ruth Maguire to move or not move. Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 112 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Thank you. I call Amendment 114 in the name of Mark Griffin. Already debated with Amendment 4. Four, and ask Mark Griffin to move or not mo move. Move. Uh, the question is that Amendment 114 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, we are not agreed, so there will be a division. Can I ask those in favour of Amendment 114 to please raise their hands? And those against? And any abstentions? Thank you. The result of the division are seven votes for and two votes against. Therefore, the amendment is agreed. I call Amendment 115 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 4, and ask Mark Griffin to move or not move. Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 115 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Yep. We are not agreed. There will be a division. Can I ask those in favour of Amendment 115 to please raise their hands? And those against? Any abstentions? Uh, the result of the division is seven votes for, two votes again. Therefore, the amendment is agreed. I call Amendment 139 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 8, and ask Mark Griffin to move or not move. Move. The question is that Amendment 139 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Um, we are not agreed, therefore there will be a division. Um, can I ask those in favour of Amendment 139 to please show their hands? Those against? <laughs> and any abstentions? Thank you. Uh, the result of the division are five votes for, uh, four votes against. Therefore, the amendment is agreed. Call Amendment 140 in the name of Alison Johnson, already debated with Amendment 4, and ask Alison Johnson to move or not move. Move. The question is that Amendment 140 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Yes. We are not agreed. Therefore, there will be a division. And I ask those in favour of the motion to please show their hands. Those against? Oh, sorry, any abstentions? Sorry, thank you, sorry. <laughs> the one time, wasn't it? Thank you. Um, the result of the division are three votes for, four votes against, and two abstentions. Therefore, the um, amendment is not agreed. So 
I call Amendment 10 in the name of the Minister and a group on its own and ask the Minister to move Amendment 10 and speak to Amendment 10. <laughs> Thank you, Convener. I, I will be as brief as I can. Um, I have always been clear that profit should never be a motive or play any part in decision-making uh, or assessing people's eligibility for disability assistance. I gave a commitment to this Parliament and to the people of Scotland in April 2017 that the private sector should not be involved in assessments for Scotland's benefits. I'm bringing forward Amendment 10 in response to a call that this commitment should be made clear on the face of the bill. It makes clear that Scottish ministers can never require an individual to attend an assessment by anyone who is not employed in the public sector and applies this across the social security system in Scotland. The amendment does allow decision makers to consider evidence derived from the private sector, for example, where the person has private healthcare arrangements, but only where the individual is content with this. It also provides for receipt of UK benefits or other assistance where, as a condition for eligibility, entitlement to those benefits depends on private sector assessments. This may be relevant in relation to early years assistance, for example, because as members who have looked at the government's published illustrative regulations will know, it is proposed that eligibility will depend on being a receipt of certain UK benefits. Uh, all of that said, I hope members can support this amendment, translating as it does my stated commitment onto the face of the bill. Thank you, Minister. Can I ask you just to formally move? I formally move. Thank you. Um, do any members wish to speak? Can I say, Mr. Tompkins? Mr. Tompkins, sorry. Um, we, won't, we won't be supporting this amendment. This is an issue on which the committee was divided uh, at stage one, um, but the majority of the committee at stage one including the Scottish Conservatives, believed that to include a formal ban on private sector contractors in the bill may lead to unintended consequences, and the majority of the committee did not support this proposal. At the time, uh, the government also didn't support the proposal in its response to our Stage 1 report. The Minister has said both to this committee before and in the Chamber that she does not support a statutory ban on um, the private sector because of the danger of unintended consequences. This is an unwelcome U-turn on the Minister's part. It's, a very, it's disappointing that she has caved into ideological pressure from the left, but it's not entirely surprising. We will not be supporting the amendment. Uh, Mr Griffin? Uh, will be no surprise that as one of the minority on the committee, uh, our stage one um, evidence and reporting um, session that I push strongly for the, the government to consider translating its policy ambition to to exclude the, the private sector from any assessments into legislation. I'm, I'm delighted to see uh, the government do so. Stakeholders and their evidence were clear that they wanted to see a statutory a ban um, that would force any incoming government who didn't share um, the same policy as um, Labour members and government members had that uh, the private sector um, have no role in, in um, assessments for social security and I think it, it gives helpful assurance and clarity to um, the 100,000 or so uh, disabled people who still have to go through um, PIP assessments and are, are desperate to see this um, being act, enacted. So um, I, I, it is a very welcome U-turn. It's not an unwelcome U-turn, as Mr Tompkins said. A very welcome um, U-turn, and I'm, I'm glad that the, the government and the minister and other members have, have caught up with our position that we felt that this was always something that, that could be um, placed within the bill to give um, people who would be going through this assessment the assurance that profit would never be a consideration. Ms McNeill. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, also like to add to what Mark Griffin um, has already said that I think the Scottish Government have to be commended for bringing this amendment forward. Um, when I joined this committee, um, the whole subject was, was quite new to me and I, I was shocked at the extent to which um, the assessment aspect um, of people undergoing, well, um, claiming, claiming benefits uh, in the manner in which it was conducted. And, and I believe that this amendment is quite clear that it's a restriction on the private sector in relation to undergoing an assessment of physical condition or physical condition or mental health. And it does not preclude um, what I think the Minister meant by the unintended consequences, perhaps, and um, we were debating at stage one, 
uh, which may be to use the private sector for other appropriate aspects of running a social security system. I do think it is important, however, um, to read this um, amendment in conjunction with what we've already debated, which is uh, in tandem with a system which is designed to promote the dignity and respect of people. Um, that would, uh, to me, is important that the rules that accompany that restriction is the all important thing. I believe this amendment is a substantial, uh, it's a substantial progress and important in the type of social security system that we have the chance to design in Scotland, and I'll be wholeheartedly supporting Amendment 10. Ms Johnson? Yeah, I'd just like to add my support and thanks to um, the Minister for bringing forward this amendment. I think if we want our social security system in Scotland to be all that we would wish it to be, this is one aspect where we really want to move away from the Westminster model. I think these assessments are the most loathsome and some of the most loathed aspects of what is in place at the moment. And it's absolutely clear that um, the private companies who've been carrying out these assessments have not been doing a good job. Otherwise, there would not be so many successful appeals. Um, so I'm, I wholeheartedly welcome this amendment and will be pleased to support it. Thank you. Mr. Uh, you know, this is ideology against good practice. If you go back 20 years, the private companies were doing medical assessments without any complaints. What an individual wants is a good assessment. Frankly, they don't care who does it. And I think, yes, we need to improve the assessments, but to rule out private companies from doing that, I just think we'll have an unfor the unforeseen circumstances. And the question I'd be interested if a minister could answer is, who is going to do it? Where are the people available to do this that will do that? And secondly, when we used to do assessments at home, no one complained done by the private sector. So what we need to look at is a good assessment and make sure the assessment is done properly. Whether that's done by the private companies or done by the state, frankly, the claimants don't care. Ms McGuire. Thank you, convener. Um, I think it's probably um, a little bit unfair to characterise this as a, as, as a U-turn, whether you're on the far right or the far left. I think it, um, addresses, from, from my and I'm sure the minister will want to, want to clarify, what our concerns were around unintended consequences. And my reading of this is that if a, a, a claimant chooses to use evidence from a private provider, that they are able, medical evidence that they are, they are able to do so, but no one will ever be compelled to attend an assessment by a private contractor. Perhaps the, the minister would, would clarify that. Briefly, Mr. Adam. Thanks, Convener. Basically, I, I don't. I think the Minister's been pretty consistent throughout this, she's always said, because this has been specifically about the cases that we've had in front of us with regards to PIP in general and the disaster from the Westminster Government and the way that people have been dragged through that system with one specific uh, company, a uh, private company in particular. And I think that shows the difference. And in, in all honesty, I, I, I don't see the idea of how come it's a U-turn, because she said from day one, the Minister has uh, said to us all that this has been a case of that uh, we didn't want to have these private companies involved in that specific process. And, you know, I don't, unlike Mr Balfour, I don't agree that the public don't care uh, who assesses them, because I'm quite sure if you mention a certain private company, you'll end up with a whole stack of people complaining to you. So I think, you know, let's, let's just stick to the actual issue that we're talking about here and just uh, remind ourselves how we're in this position. I'm going to go to the Minister to sum up. Thank, thank you very much. Um, let me make a couple of points. Let me say, first of all, that it is not uh, ideology set against good practice. I think all of the practice that we have seen uh, in terms of how the Westminster system delivers health assessments uh, tells us that that is very poor practice indeed. And the reason for that is twofold. First of all, it is because of the system uh, that is operated where the initial decisions are made without adequate information. That is in part because of how uh, the, wealth, the UK system imposes uh, time targets on uh, DWP staff making those assessments. But it is also because uh, any private company quite legitimately pursues profit. And for me, the pursuit of profit should not be the driver in how we deliver social security. It is simple. 
And in terms of previous practice, um, I am certain that I am older than Mr. Balfour, and I recall the days when assessments were done for benefits by members otherwise employed in the public sector, in health primarily, who, in addition to their day job, uh, undertook those assessments. And that is the model, to some extent, that the expert advisory group uh, and the work chaired by Dr. McDivitt from the uh, BMA GP group and uh, Ms. Burke from uh, GDA in Glasgow, working uh, on behalf of the expert group, are taking forward for me to develop the model of how we will deliver the limited number of health assessments that may be required for disability assistance that does not require people to undertake an assessment delivered by the private sector. This is not a formal ban on private contractors. Members will recall uh, my concern about that idea because of the unintended consequences that others uh, have referred to. Nor is it a U-turn uh, because, uh, as uh, colleagues have said, this has been my consistent position. What I've sought to do is trans translate that public commitment into the face of the bill in a way that makes sense does not incur uh, unintended consequences and is clear about what ministers will not do, but sensibly uh, also allows individuals to bring forward evidence in support of their application for the uh, financial support that they're entitled to if that evidence comes from uh, a private sector assessment through the means that I've already described. Uh, so my amendment, I think, is clear. It allows us to translate, as has been asked for, that very public commitment uh, onto uh, primary legislation while still re retaining the right of the individual to choose the evidence that they bring forward to support the application. All the way through this, uh, I am very clear about the centrality of individuals in our system choosing uh, what happens to them and our system facilitating that. So I think our amendment um, is worthy of support. Uh, it is not uh, a ban on the private sector inside Social Security, but is a translation of the public commitment that the private sector, uh, driven as it is and understandably so in its terms by a profit motive, should not be the deliverers of health assessments uh, inside Social Security in Scotland. Thank you, yeah. Minister. The question is that Amendment 11 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Okay. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. My apologies. The question is that Amendment 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Um, we are not agreed. There will be a division. And um, I would ask those in favour of Amendment 10 to raise their hands. And those against? And any abstentions? Thank you. The results of the division are seven votes for and two against, and the um, amendment 10 is therefore agreed. I now call amendment 141 in the name of Polly McNeill, grouped with amendments 142, 143, 144. 146, 147 and 150 and ask Polly McNeill to move Amendment 141 and speak to all the amendments in the group. And thank you, Convener. Um, these amendments are concerned with the charter being approved by regulation put before Parliament. Um, the purpose of it is to make it subject to parliamentary scrutiny so the regulations would go before Parliament if these amendments were passed and are going to give more impetus behind the charter itself. Amendment 141 adds the words that Scottish ministers, by regulations, will set out from time to time, will revise. Um, Amendment 142 deletes the word is prepared to publish from time to time to be reviewed and inserts um, the words um, and publish the charter to leave before the Scottish Parliament the draft regulations, and that's in relation to the first charter. Uh, Amendment 44 inserts the reference to the, the draft regulations. Uh, for consultation. Amendment 146, um, so where the Parliament um, has approved the regulations, only then would they be made uh, publicly um, available after parliamentary approval. 
um, Amendment 147 inserts um, where the Scottish Government have decided to make changes to the Charter that they also must be laid before the Parliament and Amendment 150 is a technical amendment uh, for completeness. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I invite any other members to speak to this group. Thank you, uh, Mr. McPherson. Thank you, Convener. Briefly, um, I am uh, unable to support these amendments uh, in the name of Pauline Meenil simply because I feel that, 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 as we heard in the evidence during uh, stage one, the, the Charter is, a, is, is going to be a document of co-production. And one of the key elements behind that is accessibility and accessible language uh, and clarity over redress. And my concern is that, uh, having looked at uh, many regulations now in my uh, time as an MSP, they are not uh, constructed or, or drafted in such accessible language. And therefore, I have concerns that these amendments will undermine that accessible language uh, th through the co-production of the, the Charter. And so I won't be supporting them. Um, I'm going to move to the Minister. Thank you. Um, let me start by saying I have no difficulty with the principle that uh, Ms McNeill um, is um, attempting to realise here in that the Parliament should have a role in approving the Charter and any changes to it. The difficulty I have with the amendments as they stand is that they put the Charter into the form of regulations. Regulations are a very particular form of legal document. There are rules around how they are expressed, how they are formatted and how they are published. None of those rules are appropriate in my view for the Charter, which is intended to be an easy read document, not a legalistic one. If the intention is to give Parliament a role in improving a final version of the Charter, then I would ask uh, Ms McNeill not to press these amendments but to work with us in advance of stage three so that you can bring an amendment forward at that point that gives Parliament such a role, but without uh, undermining the intention of the Charter. We, members will recall that we said the Charter is the, the concrete expression of the principles uh, and is one that should be uh, co-produced with uh, our stakeholders and is one indeed in which the Commission has a role. These amendments, as they stand, uh, do not do that, and they're not amendments I can support. Stage one, the committee heard expert after expert give evidence welcoming the Charter as a valuable and innovative step that could make a real difference to the people who rely on the system. It's true that many said the Charter should have more teeth, something that the Scottish Government's proposed amendments 17 and 18 deliver on. But what was universally agreed at the debate was that, above all else, this document must be clear and accessible statement of what people are entitled to expect from the system. And indeed, we've already debated, convener, uh, amendments which aim to improve clarity of communication. I'm afraid that the amendments from Ms McNeill, as they stand, will not deliver that. Not only would they require a document in regulations that is legally precise, they would require a document that would constitute part of the, Sc the law of Scotland itself. Far from something clear and accessible, we would be issuing people with detailed and complex legal provisions. Furthermore, we would be forced in into a position of potentially restricting what could appear in the Charter, no matter how much it is something people wanted, because it may not be compatible with direct legal application. That's not what people have told us they want from the Charter and what we have promised to deliver. The idea of Parliament having a role in approving a final version of the Charter is not in and of itself an issue. So long as the process by which the Charter is developed has co-design at its heart, so long as it is transparent and research-led, and so long as we are able to translate that engagement and research into a clear, accessible document, then I have no objection to the end result being laid before Parliament for its approval. But that is not what these amendments would achieve. So I ask again that Ms McNeill consider uh, not pressing these amendments, but allowing us the time with her 
uh, in advance of stage three to have a further discussion and bring forward an amendment that she can uh, propose at stage three um, that realises that intention to allow Parliament to have a, a final say on the Charter and on subsequent reviews of the Charter. Uh, but if that is not something Ms McNeill is willing to do, then I would urge the committee to reject the amendments. Thank you, Minister. I would invite Polly McNeill to wind up and to press or withdraw her amendment. Um, thank you very much. I am persuaded with what the Minister has, has said today that perhaps in uh, trying to seek at the maximum and appropriate level of parliamentary scrutiny, it doesn't quite square with the idea of the Charter being a co-produced document, and I acknowledge all of those points. Um, I, I would be um, very happy to discuss at stage three. I think that that would be the appropriate level of parliamentary scrutiny, that the Parliament would simply see the final version. Uh, I'm persuaded that that's the right way to do it. And in view of that, convener, I would seek to withdraw uh, amendment 141, which had already moved, and I would not be moving the other amendments in that group in view of that. Okay. Um, uh, the committee content that that amendment be withdrawn? Thank you. Can I call amendment 142 in the name of Pauline? Already debated and ask Pauline McNeill to formally move or not move? Not move. Thank you. Um, I'm very mindful of time, but if we do finish the next grouping, we will have finished section two of the bill. Uh, and on that, um, can I call amendment 11 in the name of the minister, grouped with amendment 60, and I invite the minister to move the amendment and speak to the amendments in the group. Thank you, convener. Um, amendment 11 in my name is a minor amendment to make it clear that the Charter can set expectations about all of the Scottish Minister's functions under parts one, two, and three of the bill. This is important because amendments are being made that add functions for ministers into part one, such as the duty to promote take-up, and these should also be captured by the Charter. I, I would ask Mr Balfour to withdraw Amendment 60, uh, since I believe it to be unnecessary. The Scottish Government has no intention of delegating any of its functions in the bill to another body. Indeed, our Amendment 10, to restrict private sector involvement in assessments, and our support for Amendment 77, in the name of Mr Adam, make clear the strength of our commitment to social security being delivered as a public service. If it is the agency that Mr Balfour has in mind, I would say that there is no legal distinction between ministers and the agency. The functions of ministers are therefore functions of the agency, and the Charter therefore binds the agency and as it binds the ministers, because they are the same legal person. Even if a future government did seek to outsource or delegate some of its functions, legally they would nevertheless continue to be functions of ministers who would rightly be held accountable for exercising them in the various ways required by the Bill. I move Amendment 11. Thank you, Minister. Can I invite Mr Balfour to speak to Amendment 60 and the other amendments in the group? Uh, in the light of the Minister's remarks, uh, I'm I won't be moving 60 and nothing to say. Thank you, Mr Balfour. Are there any further comments? No, uh, we can then move to the question, which is that Amendment 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I call uh, Amendment 60 formally for Mr Balfour, already debated, and ask Mr Balfour to move or not move. Uh, not move. Thank you. Uh, and the question is that section two be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much and thank members of the committee and the minister for their contributions this morning. And um, uh, that completes our session for today. A reminder that members that the deadline for amendments up to the end of part two, chapter two, is tomorrow at noon. And we will consider uh, consideration of further amendments and the updated Marshall Marshalled list and groupings will be issued to committee members on Monday. And on that note, I finish committee today. <laughs>